The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Though His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Him Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for preaching all salvation through one Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this series of episodes, we continue a verse-by-verse study of the book of 1 Thessalonians, using proper hermeneutical and exegetical principles. Our goal is to understand not only the details of what was going on at the time it was written, but more importantly, to understand what it is saying to God's elect in the church today. The reason, as stated before, is that 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 that God's Word states that the Bible is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, this is because our presuppositional approach and our biblical worldview as God's saints is that God is the ultimate authority for meaning, morals, truth, beauty, significance, and reality. Further, our assumption is that God has chosen to reveal himself and his attributes, his relationship to man, his plan of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and glorification via his Holy Spirit who breathes God's revelation into his word, the Bible. Now, as you will recall in our first introductory episode to 1 Thessalonians, we introduced the general geography and history and founding of the city of Thessalonica by Paul, Silas, and Timothy in uh, Acts chapter 17 therein. We found that uh, by the time that Paul had founded the church after Uh, a brief time being there, that he was forced with his companions to leave the city and to move on to Berea, to Athens, and finally to Corinth, where within a year 
he wrote both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to the church. Further, we found out that the reason that Paul and Silas and Timothy were engaged in writing the letter and in going back to the Thessalonian church to check up on them was the fact that after Paul and Silas and Timothy left, the persecution continued and the suffering and the uh, imprisonment and the beatings and the loss of property as well as even martyrdom occurred there in Thessalonica on behalf of the Thessalonians who were uh, steadfastly adhering to the doctrine that Paul had given the Thessalonians. And this persecution was brought on by a combination of the Orthodox Jews there who steadfastly denied Jesus of Nazareth as the uh, anointed Messiah and vehemently opposed the message of Christianity. This also was complicated by the secular and pagan and cultic beliefs of Thessalonica with its multitude of various false and pagan gods there that they worshipped. And finally, the fledgling Christian belief was finding antagonism with the Roman government because they thought that the Christians were promoting a new king, i.e. King Jesus, in addition to or in place of uh, the Caesar, which contradicted the idea that uh, the uh, various Caesars were not only a king, but in, were in fact a god. So for all these reasons, the Thessalonians found themselves being persecuted on a regular basis, and it is in this context that Paul, Silas, and Timothy continued to minister to and write letters to the Thessalonian church. This brings us to uh, the letter of First Thessalonians per se, so if you'll join me in opening your copy of God's Word to chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians, we'll dig in. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus, that is Silas, and Timotheus, that is Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we could pass this verse off as a simple introductory, salutary uh, verse, just simply meant to open the letter, but I believe that by properly exegeting the verse and by looking in depth at the various ideas that are uh, couched in this verse, we can, in fact, learn a lot about uh, Christianity and the mindset of Paul in the early church. To begin with, the word church found in chapter 1. In the Greek is ekklesia, or out-called ones. It's a compound word, ek meaning out, and kaleo meaning called. So these were the out-called ones. In other words, this letter that Paul is writing is only to those whom God has called out, which the Thessalonians clearly were, otherwise he would not have sent the letter to them. This letter is to the church and to those whom God has called out to himself. This letter is not to the world, the unregenerate, or the atheist. Thus, those in any age who are truly called out are God's church, and this letter is to you. Second of all, the church being in Christ. The true church is in Jesus, the Christ, who is Lord. While this may seem axiomatic, and for the true church it is, because there is no true church outside of Christ, there are many churches peripheral to Christ, parallel to, and in all kinds of external positions with regard to Christ. There are in fact many who use the name Christ on their building or on their signs or in their name and pretend but here we are defining a church as those who are in Christ. So the question is, what does it mean to be in Christ and how do we get there? 
Now, for a more extended discussion of what a church is or isn't, I would direct the interested listener to questions about the church and to those interested on knowing more about what a Christian is or is not, I would direct those interested into the episode entitled Questions About Christianity. However, in short, the answer to this question of what constitutes uh, the true church in Jesus, the Christ who is Lord, the answer goes back to the created purpose of God demonstrated in the type and shadow of the creation ordinance and institution of biblical marriage. As you will recall in Genesis, God places Adam into a sleep while Eve is created from Adam's rib out of his side. In the New Testament, we find the substance, the second Adam, Christ, who is slain, I put to sleep, according to God's will. Jesus' Jesus's side is pierced, and from Christ's propitiatory sacrifice, the church, i.e. the outcalled ones, Christ's bride, was and is created. In both cases, it is God who is responsible for bringing calling, drawing the bride, Eve, the church, to her groom, Adam, i.e. Christ. In both cases, the two are made one, and there's an invisible union between them, as Paul confirms in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 30 through 32. Quote, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church." Unquote. So both relationships are initiated, maintained, sanctified by God. Adam has nothing to do with creating or establishing his relationship with Eve, just as we have nothing to do with creating or establishing our relationship with Christ. It is all grace. For more information on this issue of uh, the church, Christ, and his bride, I would direct the listener to the episode entitled Questions About Biblical Marriage as well as the episode entitled, What God Joins Together. Moving on and looking at this verse, we next come to the word grace, which is in Greek, charis. This word is the merciful, unmerited kindness by which God sovereignly chooses to exert his holy influence upon our soul, wooing us and turning us from our deserved wrath, destruction, and eternal separation from him in hell to an undeserved adoption to Christ by and through Christ's suffering to inheritance of his riches and eternal life. In addition to which God, the Holy Spirit, keeps, strengthens, increases, empowers, and enables his chosen in Christian faith knowledge, affection, and brings forth various fruits as evidence of our relationship. Next we have the word peace, which in Greek is irene. Peace may be defined as a state of mind wherein one is calm. The problem is that all too often this kind of peace is contingent on circumstances and the environment. However, peace can also be defined as regarding the forensic status of our soul. According to this definition, peace is the absence of conflict. It is a cessation of againstness with God. In this case, the conflict, the enmity, is what was created by Adam and Eve at the fall due to our sin and rebellion. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 7, as long as we remain in our old nature, we remain in enmity with God and deserve his wrath. Romans 8 verse 7 says this, quote, Because the carnal mind is 
enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be." Unquote. So once God is pleased to draw us into a living relationship with himself through the finished work of Christ, God's wrath, which we deserve, is poured out on Christ and satisfied completely once and for all, while Christ's righteousness is poured out and imputed to us, which we can never deserve and is once and for all. Those in this situation are no longer at enmity with God. Instead, we have peace. This situational peace then allows us to have a profound and inalterable mental peace of mind since the reason for it is final. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 13 through 16 confirm this. Quote, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that is, God and man, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby." Unquote. One can also see, looking at this verse, how the language also fits perfectly with the idea of marriage, biblical marriage ordained in the garden and the language found there in bringing Adam and Eve together. But in any case, as this verse concludes, this peace and grace is from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, because indeed the type of peace and grace in question can only come from them. In any case, we can see that having looked closely at verse 1, verse 1 is much more than a simple salutation. There's quite a bit of theological meat there to chew on. Moving to verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Here, the quote-unquote making mention is better translated, quote-unquote, remembering, because it is right to always give God the thanks and the glory for those whom he has brought into a saving knowledge and relationship with himself. Secondly, like Paul, we should be diligent to make a habit to bring to mind, to intimately remember brothers and sisters in Christ, and to lift up their needs and to give thanks for their provision and protection in prayer. Verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Now, since Paul, Silas, and Timothy left Thessalonica, which has been under one year, Paul and his companions have regularly and routinely given thanks for three things. One, the Thessalonians, their work of faith. Two, their labor of love. And three, their patience of hope. Let's look at these three and consider them. Number one, their work of faith. First of all, the word faith in Greek is pistis. The best definition, the best biblical definition that I've found for biblical faith is an action based upon a belief and supported by confidence that can be shortened into A, B, C, action, belief, confidence. This action, belief, and confidence is in something or someone which or who cannot be seen. 
All three ingredients must be present in order for faith to exist. The A in action is sometimes also referred to as quote-unquote works or quote-unquote fruit. So here in this verse, Paul is constantly mindful and thankful for the Thessalonians and their work of faith. In other words, the Thessalonians had completely believed and had confidence in the gospel message which Paul and his companions delivered to them. More importantly, the Thessalonians went beyond mere abstract belief and confidence. Instead, the Thessalonians, as, in the as is the case for all true believers, had, by God's grace and power, transitioned their belief and confidence into actions. In the verses and chapters to come, we will find out more specifics about what the actions, fruit, and works took uh, the form of. But for now, the important issue was that the Thessalonian faith was alive and real as proved by the actions or works, instead of the alternative, which is a faith without works, which is dead. James makes this same argument in James chapter 2, verses 17 through 22, and also verse 26. Quote, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by his works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only? Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also, unquote. Now, if we plug in the ABC faith formula to James's argument, we can better see how faith and works are axiomatic companions rather than diametrically opposed pursuits. Let's paraphrase James's argument. Quote, Even so, belief and confidence, if it hath not action, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast belief and confidence and I have action. Show me thy belief and confidence without action, and I will show thee my belief and confidence by my action." Unquote. In other words, as in the case of Abraham and Rahab, or anyone else, belief and confidence are passive, empty virtues unless and until you commit an action which demonstrates the reality of said belief and confidence. Likewise, action by itself rarely, if ever, articulates what is the belief and confidence which motivates the action. So here, in summary, what we need to understand is a faith that works is accompanied by works as the fruit of faith. Or said differently, works are the evidence of salvation, 
not the basis of salvation. Next, number two, we look at labor of love. Labor in the Greek is the word kopos. It means arduous work whose motive is the effort expended and is based upon altruistic love to accomplishing it. Paul could have but did not use the Greek word ergon, which also means work, but the work is focused on the deed itself and the work itself without any altruistic motives. Love is the Greek word agape, which simply means self-sacrificial love. So, secondly, Paul is constantly mindful and thankful for the Thessalonians and their altruistic labor of self-sacrificial love. Then number three, we have patience of hope. The word patience in the Greek is hypomone. It means a steadfastness, a constancy, an endurance. The word hope in Greek is elpis, which means a joyful, confident, and expectation of eternal salvation. So thirdly, Paul is constantly mindful and thankful for the Thessalonians and their steadfast endurance and confident expectation of salvation. In all three cases, their work of faith, their labor of love, their patience of hope, Paul is giving constant thanks, as can we, regarding the Thessalonians or anyone else, because when these things are present, they are present because that saint or that church is in the Lord Jesus Christ. These things can only be found when and if we are positionally in Christ, as is discussed in verse 1 with our relationship as the bride or the outcalled ones of Christ. Verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. The word election in the Greek is ekloge. As we look at the various usages of the biblical word ekloge, we find that one, it's the act of picking out or choosing, as in A, an act of God's free will by which before the foundation of the world he decreed his blessings to certain persons. And B, the decree made from choice by which he determined to bless certain persons through Christ by grace alone. Two, it is a thing or person chosen. In this case, it deals with persons who are God's elect. Now, Looking at verse 4, we find out that the relationship of being an outcalled one, i.e. a saint or bride of Christ, as well as the fruit of that relationship, which, is, which in part is our work of faith, our labor of love, and our patience of hope, are all things which are a result of God sovereignly choosing and electing us to these things. Secondly, they are acts of God's grace that he works out through the uh, process called sanctification in our lives, where he uses various processes to refine that faith and to further produce a greater quantity as well as a greater quality of fruit in our lives. Verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much conviction, as ye know what manner of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Looking at the word power, the Greek word for power is dunamai, or, which is where we get our English word dynamite. In this case, Paul, Silas, Timothy, all had the testimony that their preaching and teaching 
was not mere words alone. Unlike the hireling, their testimony was accompanied by power via the Holy Spirit and with much conviction, as was their daily example. The proof was the results and the ongoing progress of the Thessalonian church as it matured and grew daily. Finally, we have verse 6 in this episode, where it says, You also became imitators, followers of us and of the Lord, having received, embraced the word, doing great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In this case, the word imitators is the evidence of the reality that what Paul, Timothy, and Silas were doing was wrought by God. The Thessalonians were imitating or emulating the same qualities as were present with Paul and with Timothy and Silas. This is always the fruit of the Spirit filled. God blesses and anoints fellowship, preaching, and teaching when it is a sincere and Christ-centered. For the time being, this concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls around me, I rest and know that He has found me. Christ the rock is my foundation. I will trust in Him, I will trust in Him. I will trust in Him.